Okay. okay. I'm going to uh, try and redo the Unit 11 video. Um, so we'll see how this works. Uh, hopefully, I'm trying some new software. The f output format is will be MP4, so we'll see how that works. Um, and hopefully, uh, there won't be glitches and sprites halfway through. Um, all right, so let me shrink myself down a little bit here. And we're going to do Unit 11 again. We're going to talk about flip-flops. So, oh yeah, I didn't update that. So we're going to talk about the, the, the four kinds of latches slash flip-flops. Just a, a point to begin with. We call things latches when there's not a formal clock involved. Um, although that's not a pure statement, uh, there's sort of exceptions to that, but that's the idea. We call things flip-flops when, uh, when there is a clock. Uh, typically, the only real latch we talk about are uh, SR latches, and we'll, that'll be the first thing we're going to introduce. And then we're going to work our way up to the standard JK Master Slave flip-flop, and then talk about how we can turn that into other types of um, uh, uh, other types of uh, flip flops, the D and the T, most particularly. Okay. So, oops, yeah. So, why are we talking about flip flops? Well, the primary reason we're talking about flip flops is because uh, when we do our sequential design, which remember that's the last part of the course. So the course is really in thirds. First third was a switching algebra and, bo and Boolean uh, uh, you know, binary systems, uh, the definition of digital encode, encoding schemes and things like that. Uh, the second part was combinational design. That's what we're finishing up now and we're kind of transitioning. Um, we will include flip-flops on the, mid the next midterm coming up in a few weeks. Um, which I'll set up online. Um, the, the last part, the last third, is sequential design. Now sequential design definitely builds on what we've covered and within se sequential design there'll be lots of combinational design logic blocks that we'll use but we'll also have memory in our sequential designs and the memory will keep track of what state we're in and the state will represent uh, the part of the previous inputs, the history, if you will, of previous inputs that we, that we need to know in order to, to generate the proper outputs. We'll, we'll expand on that, but, but you can think a little bit like this. Um, if you think of, say, a traffic light, that's the perfect example of a, of a state system. And what's interesting about traffic lights is that uh, there are cer certain states that you can get into that are very brief, and if you didn't know what state you came from, your brief time in that state, uh, you wouldn't know what to do next. So, so even though the states might have the same outputs, they they would be different states. So, for instance, when your light changes from uh, green to red, uh, and the other light changes from red to green, uh, the green light typically goes yellow and then it turns to red. There's a small time when all the lights are red. Now during that small time, that's a different state. But that state has to know that, say, the north-south lanes had been green, but now the east-west lanes are going to become green. And that has to be a different state, even though for a short time everything's red. When you're switching the other direction, you'll have another state where everything's red, but, but it's not the same state. And and so uh, that's because you have to remember prior history. And how do you remember prior history? You remember prior history with flip-flops. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to press into this uh, study of flip-flops. Uh, hopefully that will help you understand why flip-flops are very important. Now you might also ask, well gosh, we have other kinds of memory, right? Random access memory in our computers, we have ROMs, you know, read-only memory, things like that. And yes, it is true we have those things, but those generally are not used to, uh, to store the state of our, uh, of our state machines because they're not fast enough. They're much slower, oh, like disk drives. Yes, you could write it out on a disk drive, but uh, the problem is 
you have to have lots of uh, uh, logic operating to read things in and off a disk drive and it takes a lot of time to get it in and off there is no comparison to the speed of a flip-flop basically and that's why computer all all the registers and computers are basically flip-flops um, because that's the fastest uh, memory elements that we can that we have at least at this point all right remember that all our memory elements our flip-flops can be in one of two stable states true or false zero or one ground or the normal voltage the system's running on like 5 volts or 3.3 or 1.8 or whatever it is uh, and uh, and normally the, that that flip-flop will hold as long as it stays powered up it'll hold that state until you do something to change it all right so that's the idea all right so um, how do we get as a, a, a device to, to have memory well basically it involves feedback uh, so let's see how that works. If we start with the basic uh, building block for all flip-flops, which is this SR latch. Again, call the latch because there's no clock. Uh, this SR latch uh, has two NOR gates. And, they're, and the, they have a very interesting feature here. Notice the output of this NOR gate is fed back in to the input of this NOR gate. And the output of this NOR gate is, sorry, the output of this NOR gate is fed back in to the input of this NOR gate. In addition, there's one other input for each of the NOR gates. This one up here has an input called S for set. This one down here has an input R for reset. And the output that this latch generates is Q. And normally the, the Q output comes out here. Now, in actuality, it comes out of the NOR gate that has the R input. But when we draw it with a simple block diagram, we will normally put the Q opposite the S because we don't show the internal circuit. So you don't really care which NOR gate Q came out. In fact, you don't even care if they're NOR gates. Uh, uh, you just look at it as a block diagram. And that's how it's normally represented, just with a box and not showing the, the circuitry inside. And in that box, we normally put Q opposite S and Q prime opposite R. Now, one very interesting thing about latches and flip-flops is that we normally have uh, all the outputs available to us. We have in this case Q and Q prime. And of course normally Q, if Q is 1, Q prime would be 0. If Q is 0, Q prime would be 1. They are the, the logical opposites of each other as you've learned so far. And that's one of the reasons why when we talk about uh, when we uh, do equations with say A prime, B, C prime, we don't have to put an inverter on the A. We can just put A prime directly into a gate. And that's because in many cases we actually have A and A prime available coming out of flip-flop A and B and B prime coming out of flip-flop C or B and C and C prime coming out of flip-flop C. So flip-flops usually provide both outputs and that's to, to save us from having to have inverters since these values are available internally they might as well come out and be available for our use downstream okay so in this case we do have a q and a q prime but remember when you draw the block diagram even though the q really is associated with the nor gate that has the r input we normally write q up uh, opposite the s when we're just using a block diagram and not showing the internal circuitry okay we draw a little table to uh, represent how this works it's kind of a truth table but it's there is a there is a little bit of a quirk to this truth table as you'll see and and that quirk is we introduce this concept called q plus or if we were labeling this the a flip-flop we would have a prime and a a and a prime we would label this a plus what that means is as different say from say q here it means this Q plus is the next state of Q. Now, in most cases, that means after the next clock edge. Uh, in the case of where there's no clock, it just means after when you when you make a change, then there's a small propagation delay, and now you have the new state of Q. Uh, so, but normally it means after the clock edge when there's a clock. Okay, this is the characteristic equation, and it says that that the the next output for Q will be s ordered with r prime q so if we look at this table this kind of makes this a little simpler there is however a condition that has to be met and that is that 
S and R don't equal zero. Uh, sorry, that S and R equal zero, which means that S cannot be one and R one at the same time. One of them always has to be zero. You can't have them both one at the same time. All right, so, and we'll see why that is. Okay, so uh, there's a little animation here. I'm gonna show that, and then I'm gonna come back to this, uh, this slide. So here's the animation. And the red represents uh, the one state, and the black represents the uh, zero state. Right now, you can see Q is red, so it's a one, and there, therefore Q bar, or Q prime, the inverse of Q is zero, so it's black. Notice how we have a black input for R and a black input for S. So that's showing you that the, these are both low, they're zeros. And notice how we feed back this one input to this gate, and the zero output here goes back as an input to this gate. Now, if you think this through, here's what happens. We have, let's say we powered up in this state. So Q is 1, and the output from this NOR gate is 1. This 1 goes in here. The 1, along with a 0 into, an, into a, a NOR gate before the bubble, would be a 1, but after the bubble, it becomes a 0. And that 0 is fed back in here. A 0 from the feedback loop and a 0 from R give you a 0 before the bubble and a 1 after the bubble. And the 1, then, is fed back in here. So you can see this basically locks this, this, this uh, system into this current configuration. So as long as you keep these powered, this is going to stay in a Q high, Q bar low. Now, what happens if we, say, raise R to a 1? Well, notice, instead of this before the bubble, this NOR gate will produce a 1, and after the bubble, it will produce a 0, which will turn off this one feedback into this NOR gate. So now we have two zeros going in. So before the bubble, we have a zero. After the bubble, we have a one. This one will be fed back in here, and we'll have a one from R and a one from the feedback loop going in, which be before the bubble is a one and after the bubble is a zero. So you can see what's going to happen is we're going to flip it so it's in the opposite state where Q is zero and Q bar is one. Now, if I hit the space bar, this is gonna continually cycle back and forth, and I'll let you watch this for a minute. Uh, I can't stop it, though, I don't think. So, uh, so we'll just have to watch it, and it, it goes at about a one second rate. So you can see R was one, now S is one, and it flips it. Now it's back to where it was. Now R is 1, and it flips it to Q bar being 1 and Q being 0. Now S flips it back. As long as S and R are the same, uh, 0, it's stable in holding whatever state it's in. But if you raise one of them, and, and only one of them, to a 1, then what happens is it flips state, or at least if you raise the right one. So if it's set and you raise reset, it'll reset. If it's reset and you raise set, it'll set. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So, so back to this. So the reason why we can't have S and R be one at the same time, if we do that, if we make them both one at the same time, what you'll see here is that, uh, is that the S uh, is a one, then before the bubble, it's gonna be a one, after the bubble, it would be a zero. And if R is a one, before the bubble, it's gonna be a one, after the bubble, it's going to be a zero. So that would make Q prime and Q one at the same time. And that's why we say this condition where S and R are both one is unstable. It's not so much that it's unstable, it's just that it's, it's, it, it communicates something that shouldn't be true. Q prime and Q should never both be zero. And so that's a problem um, because they're supposed to be the opposite of each other. And that's why we have this condition. Now, the unstable part comes in if you have S and R one at the same time and then you remove them simultaneously, then you don't know what state the flip-flop's going to settle in. If you remove one and then the other, you will know. But if you remove them at exactly the same instant, it's going to settle in one of two states, but you don't know which one. So that's where the, uh, uh, the instability uh, comes in. Okay. All right, moving on.
So we can look at this with a diagram, like I said before, where we just draw a box and notice how we put S and R, set and reset, and notice how we put Q opposite of set. That's just the way we typically write this symbol, even though you know in reality that the Q is actually connected to the NOR gate that R goes into. But you don't see the NOR gates in here, so it doesn't matter. Okay, and that's how we normally write it. We wouldn't write the two symbols. We would write it as a box. Uh, notice this, this truth table over here. Uh, again, notice that we have this Q plus, the next state of Q. So what this is telling us, our our current input S, our current input R, our current state of the flip-flop Q, what's going to happen? That's Q plus. So if, if we have this condition here, this is what is going to result. Q will change in some cases. Q will not change in other cases. Here it's the same. There it's the same. Remember, whenever S and R are both zero, you're going to hold. Whenever R is one, you're going to be locked into a zero. So if, if Q happened to be one, but R is now one, it's going to go to zero. And here you're going to set. So remember, R is reset. So when R is one, it's going to reset it to zero. Set is, the S is set. So when S is one, it's going to set it. And then we have this, these as, uh, as, as, as don't cares because we say these conditions are never going to occur. One and one should never be at the same time. Uh, S and R should never be both one at the same time. Okay. So, uh, so that's, that's a pretty good description of the SR latch. Okay, now, remember, the SR latch is, is the basic uh, building block for all of our flip-flops. So, let's see, I'm going to pop this up just a second. So, uh, what, what we know is that... Um, What we know is that um, the um, that that because we have this problem. First off, there's no clock, and normally we want to use clocks with flip flops. So we have to figure out some way to incorporate a clock. Secondly, we have this condition that we're not allowed to have S and R one at the same time, and so that's kind of a awkward situation. We don't really want that. We'd like a device where we where we can uh, have a little more freedom with our inputs. All right, so so now we're going to see how we can take this SR latch and put some gates on it and change it around a little bit so it becomes eventually a master-slave JK flip-flop. Now, I, I we're going to go through a couple of steps before we get there. I'm just going to cover those briefly because uh, they're, they're only of minimal interest, at least for this course. They, they certainly get use, but, uh, but we're not going to use them particularly here. All right, so shrink again, and then, um, so we can do a thing called uh, gate the latch. So we can, put a, we can put two AND gates here, and we can connect a, a common input from both AND gates and call it a gate. And so what happens is when the gates uh, when the gate's zero in this case, then both of these AND gates are going to output zeros regardless of R and S, and that'll force this latch into a hold condition. When we want to allow you to change the latch, then we can make the gate active. In this case, active means making the gate a one, and then if R is raised, it'll reset the latch, and R if S is raised, it'll re it'll set the latch. If, of course, it might already be set or reset. We don't know, but but that's what will happen. So so the so the gate basically gates our inputs, either allows them to have an effect on the on the SR latch, or prevents them from having an effect. Okay, so that's a, that's a that's a gated RS latch. But it, again, it doesn't avoid the situation. You might have the gate active, and then you can make R and S both one. And that would violate our requirement. So it doesn't fix that problem. Um, and it doesn't actually have a clock either. Okay, golly, sorry for jumping around. We can also do this thing called a gated D latch. Now, whenever we use the term D, uh, we're, we, it's going to imply a certain uh, filter on the input, and that filter looks like this. Our D goes in, and on the reset side, we invert it, and on the set side, we don't invert it. 
Now, it, what this does, this does uh, prevent the, um, this does prevent the, la the, the condition that R and S would be both one at the same time. That can now never happen because if D is one, then R is going to be zero and S is one. If D is zero, R is going to be one and S will be zero. They'll never be one at the same time because of this inverter in this circuit. And then we still have our gate here. So our gate can be active and then whatever we set D at, the latch is going to follow. When the gate is closed, then D can change and it won't have any effect on the latch. This is something that, that often does. This is not an atypical circuit. This is one you will find. And here's the, the truth table. Uh, and notice here we have the gate, the D, and the Q, present state of the Q, and this Q plus N is the next state. It's what happens when you have this condition, then this will eventuate. And sometimes it flips D and sometimes it doesn't. Or sorry, it flips the present state and sometimes it doesn't. But one thing's for sure, uh, when the gate is the gate is inactive, the flip-flop holds. When the gate is active, the flip-flop follows D. And here's a little bit of a timing diagram, which shows when the gate's active in this period here, then the D has an effect on Q. When the gate's inactive, like in this period, then there's no change in Q. Here it stays zero, and here it stays one. All right, now we're gonna get into a clock, but I, I'm not gonna talk about this one because um, what I wanna do is I wanna talk about the master slave JK flip flop, because that's really that's really what exists. That's what we use, and and we can turn this master slave JK flip flop into two other types of flip flops: the D flip flop and the T flip flop. And so this is really kind of uh, this is key. All right. Now the the uh, it's called master slave because it has a master stage and a slave stage, and both of these stages are simple RS latches. And all we've done is use feedback from the very output of the flip-flop all the way back to the very input. So from the slave stage output to the master stage input. And we've added AND gates on the two inputs, both on the master stage and on the slave stage. On the slave stage, the only inputs are the clock after it goes through an inverter and the outputs from the first stage. But on the master stage, we have a JK input, we have the feedback from the slave stage, and we have the clock input. Now, the way this works is very straightforward, but you should take uh, some time and look at this diagram and make sure you understand what's going on. Uh, the JK flip-flop allows J and K to be one at the same time. Because of this feedback, it's, it will always prevent uh, R and S being, get, being one at the same time. And because we have a Q, a bar here and a Q, or a Q prime here and a Q, the, uh, these are, this R and S will never be one at the same time either. They'll always be the opposite of each other, or both be zero, but they can't both be one. Just like here, they can both be zero, but they can't be one. Now when they're zero, the then this latch is in hold mode. And when the, uh, this R and S are both zero, this latch is in a hold mode. Uh, so the output wouldn't change. What happens if you look at the clock, during one half of the clock cycle, when the clock is high, these AND gates are active, and these AND gates are guaranteed to be zero outputs because the clock is, if it's one here, after the inverter, it's zero. So you have a zero into this AND gate and a zero into this AND gate from the clock, which means no matter what these outputs are here, the Q and the Q prime from the master stage, they, uh, these, this R and S and the slave stage will be both zero, so this slave stage will hold. <coughs> <coughs> so what, what this allows you to do then is during one half of the clock cycle, you can change the master RS latch without affecting the slave stage or the outputs. And then when the clock flips from low to hot or high to low, you propagate the output of this latch to the slave stage on that, on that transit, that clock transition, on that clock uh, 
edge. In this case, it's on a falling edge. Um, but you can make it the other way around. You can put the inverter over here and make it a rising edge clock. Works either way. Uh, you just how it just depends on where the inverter is placed. When when the when the uh, when these flip flops are active, or sorry, when these AND gates are active, where the clock is uh, after the inverter is a one, then before the inverter it's zero, which means that you can't change this latch, and that's that's basically there to prevent glitches from getting propagated through. So during this time, you can freely change J and K without having any effect on the flip-flop. But then when the clock goes from low to high, then it turns off these AND gates, putting this output into a hold mode, but it allows your new inputs to affect the master stage and set a new possible value in the master stage. And then when you get the next falling edge clock, in this case, you will propagate that change onto the slave stage, but you will lock the master stage, you will put it into hold mode uh, so that it's not changing uh, during that entire time. And, and so what this does, this gives us nice, clean transitions only on the active edge of the clock. In this particular diagram, the falling edge of the clock. And that, that makes the behavior of these flip-flops very predictable, very precise, and uh, you know that the output stage is not going to change again until the next falling edge of the clock. Now, it might not change then if you haven't changed the inputs, but it, but it can't change until that time. That's the only time that it could change is the next active edge of the clock. Um, and that's what makes these very nice in our clock systems. Okay, now what can you do with a JK flip-flop? Well, you can do you can remember you can remember one bit, and it can be zero or it can be one, and that's really all it can do. But that that one bit can be combined with a bunch of other bits to make a register uh, of maybe eight flip-flops or sixteen flip-flops or sixty-four flip-flops. That register can be in a in a in the the guts of a of a CPU. Can be in the guts of an arithmetic logic unit. Uh, it can be uh, as part of a state machine, remembering what state you're in, uh, depending on how many states you have, will determine how many flip-flops you have to have to remember what state you're in. All right, we can take that same master-slave JK flip-flop and turn it into um, a, uh, we can turn it into a uh, D flip-flop or a T flip-flop. Now, the D flip-flop is extensively, widely and, and, uh, used all, all the time. The T flip-flop is kind of a, becoming a rare bird. I don't think it's used all that much anymore. We used to use them in discrete counters as separate parts, but uh, those have kind of gone away uh, because we don't use discrete parts anymore. We put a lot of uh, logic on a single chip and, and do it that way. Um, so, so the T was more for a counter. The T stands for toggle. Uh, I don't know what the D, D stands for data, I guess. I don't know. So here are the four types. An RS latch, a D flip-flop, and these are all the characteris characteristic equations. You can see the D flip-flop is real easy. The next state of Q is just simply D. And then the JK, it's a little bit complicated. We have J Q prime plus K prime Q. So, the, so you have to look at it this way. And then the T is just TQ prime, T prime Q. Now what's interesting is um, for the T, the T has two modes. It either is holding when T is zero, or if T is one, on each clock edge it toggles. The D on the other hand always propagates whatever value of D is, that's what Q becomes. Um, and we are going to design a uh, uh, in the next unit, we're going to design some basic circuits with these uh, four types of uh, latches and flip-flops. And what you'll see is that the, the, the circuit with the least amount of gates in it is typically the JK, where we use a JK flip-flop. 
but because every flip-flop has two inputs we have to connect, there's more wires involved than just connecting a single input, like a D or a T. And then you'll see that uh, next to the JK, the RS has the next least amount of logic, and then the D, and finally the T, is uh, typically has the, the most gates to, to do an arbitrary design. Now it might be a little simpler if all we're doing is a counter. The T could be, uh, could be a, a good solution for that. But everywhere else, it's usually the worst solution. Um, and here's a couple of circuits that show how you can take a D flip-flop and make it into a JK. But uh, realistically, I, I can't imagine why we'd want to do that since normally we made the D out of a JK to begin with. Uh, and it takes, you know, it takes an inverter and three gates. It's just a mess. But we do often uh, take uh, a JK and make it into a D by adding an inverter. If you take the inverter away, this becomes a T. So when you want to choose a flip-flop for a design, these are, the, these are the considerations. Normally, if we have some really high-speed thing and we're trying to, we're trying to create a, a register that's going to capture uh, data the quickest, then what we'll do is use an RS clock latch. Uh, if we want uh, uh, the least amount of logic, because we're, we're, we're trying to minimize space on a chip or something, then we might use a JK, but it does increase the wiring, so that's a problem too. So sometimes we just uh, go with a D. And um, uh, this is typically what we do use in our very large uh, scale integrated circuits. Um, the T flip-flop, uh, if you're doing a counter, you might want to set it up with T's. That's about the only place where T's are useful. Now, along with these, all the inputs we've described, we often add some uh, two additional inputs, a preset and a clear. In fact, sometimes even other inputs. In fact, sometimes multiple clocks and things like that. Uh, but we have a preset and a clear. Uh, and that is, those are, those are, we call these asynchronous inputs, so we can force the flip-flop into a, a predetermined state without having to wait for the next clock edge. Uh, and this is particularly useful uh, on power up to uh, to establish initial conditions. Uh, okay, so we've talked about combinational versus sequential logic. This just kind of reviews that one more time. Uh, remember, uh, in 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 our combinational logic, all we do, all we're concerned about is the current state of the inputs. Whereas in our sequential design, you'll see that we have to take into consideration some history. It might be a lot of history, it might be very little history, depending on how many different states we have. Um, and depending on how we implement our sequential logic, uh, sometimes we have to wait for the next uh, inputs before we can read our outputs. We'll talk about that later. Um, all right. Uh, typically, though, the storage elements to remember our current state, which basically tells us the history we need to know, uh, we typically use uh, flip-flops for that. And these sequential designs almost always have, they're almost always synchronous systems with a clock controlling the whole thing, keeping it all synchronized together. And that's because it's, it's very difficult to design it any other way. If you, you theor in theory, you could have a completely asynchronous system with no clock, but it would be a nightmare to uh, guarantee its behavior. Uh, and to actually construct it and, and think your way through this, it would really be a, a lot of hassle to do it without a clock. And so that's why we almost always uh, do use a clock. Although I suppose it's possible that a, a cleverly designed asynchronous system might be uh, might have slight, might have better performance. All right, um, this is the traffic light example. So here's where we have uh, we have two different combinational logic blocks, and this is very typical. One uh, determines the outputs, which basically are the, the, the various on and off signals to the, to the traffic lights themselves, so the red, the green, and the yellow. And then we have a bunch of flip-flops uh, driven by a clock, which is where we remember the state that we're in. Uh, north, south, green, east, west, red, and then we go to north, south, yellow, and then north, south, red, east, west, red as well, and then finally east, west, green, and 
north, south stays red, and, and so forth. So we remember the state with these flip-flops, and we'll just give the state a number, and then we'll encode that number in binary and let the flip-flops represent that number. Um, the next state combination of logic takes our current state and our new inputs, whatever they might be, and determines what the next state will be. Now in a traffic light, unless you have sensors, the traffic light uh, doesn't really have any inputs. But if you have sensors, then it does. It has sensors for left lane uh, turning. It has sensors for whether there are cars waiting to go in the opposite direction or not. Um, things like that. All right. One more thing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this timing diagram. Um, this, this is uh, based on a 74 LS74 uh, edge trigger D flip flop that uh, comes two of them in this, uh, I think it's a 14 pin package. Um, and here's some part of the data sheet from this. And this shows a couple of things. Here's the D input, here's the clock, and here's the output Q. And it tells us a couple of things. One, we have some requirements on our input. Our input has to be good for 20 nanoseconds before the clock goes from low to high. And it has to stay good for 5 nanoseconds after that transition. The clock has to be at least 25 nanoseconds wide. Uh, or, or it, we can't guarantee that it's going to work properly. And the amount of time it takes for the output to go from a low to a high transition is guaranteed to be no more than 25 nanoseconds and the typical time is 13. But interestingly, look on the other end, we have the same data set up and data hold times as, bef as before, but now we, we have a different time, the different maximum guarantee for how long it will take for, for our, the output from our flip-flop to go from a 1 to a 0. Here, we're guaranteed that it won't take any more than 40 nanoseconds, and the uh, typical is 25. So notice it's almost twice as fast having the output go from low to high as it is having the output go from high to low. And uh, you just should always keep in mind there's no guarantee at all on any logic device that the, the rise time and the fall times will be absolutely symmetric. They, they often and typically aren't. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to say anything about this except um, if, if we want, this is the typical symbol for a flip-flop. Uh, and we have an input D, we have an output Q, and like I said, normally we do have a Q and a Q prime output. And uh, the, the clock, uh, the clock here, uh, usually ha it has this little carrot on it, assuming it's an edge-triggered clock. Whereas if it's not an edge trigger clock, such as in this 7476, it's a level clock, then uh, as long as the clock is active, D will change during the clock and Q will change. This is not true in this flip flop. Whatever D is when the clock hits, that locks it in until the next clock edge. And so that little carrot tells us it's an edge trigger clock. And we don't use these much at all. Uh, these level sensitive latches, we almost always use these edge trigger clocks. In this case, because there's no bubble on the input, it's a rising edge clock. But if there's a bubble on the input, then it's a falling edge clock. And so that's good to know. And like I say, there's usually a Q and a Q prime, and there might be also a set and a reset. All right, well, that's, that's going to complete the, um, the, the lecture for today. And um, again, uh, there'll be a little five question quiz to go with this. You don't have to do the quiz till next week. That's fine. Uh, I'll, but this quiz will be a little different. This quiz will be uh, uh, more of a reflection. And uh, what I want you to do is uh, I'm going to give you uh, a few things to think about. And I'd just like you to write a, a, a one pager, maybe a couple of paragraphs, no more than a page or more if you want, I guess. Uh, uh, just your thoughts uh, on these things. So this will just kind of be a reflection. Uh, and you can turn it in next week. I think I'd like you to turn this in uh, maybe Monday at midnight along with the other quizzes. Uh, uh, well, this is this is actually the quiz for Wednesday. I'm, I'm sorry. This is actually the lecture for Wednesday. I'll do another lecture in a minute here for Friday. Um, 
and we'll see if we can't uh, get this to work. All right, so bear, just hang in there. Uh, I know it's a little bit um, anxiety producing to have all these changes. Uh, it definitely is upsetting to me that, you know, I, I really am um, sad that we're not, uh, we're not gonna see each other in class. Um, and it's, uh, it's not the same, but um, by the same token, it's kind of different, kind of fun. And hopefully you're kind of enjoying having a little more time not to have to get in your car and drive to school. Uh, so hang in there, stay safe. Uh, I think uh, as a physician, I can tell you that the, uh, you know, that, that the isolation is definitely the best thing to be doing. Uh, you guys will probably get the virus and have a fairly mild case, but, uh, but uh, you could pass it to somebody who could die from it. So it's a, it's a good thing to, for you to stay safe and not get infected and uh, not, be, uh, not cause anybody else to get infected and not uh, to, to continue to propagate the, uh, the virus. Um, so uh, we don't really know. Of course, there are some young people that have died. Uh, so it's, uh, it's always a concern. All right, but you're gonna probably be just fine. Just uh, be careful and take proper precautions. All right. Done.